Hi there, and welcome back to Atomy Geography. This lesson is the second part of our two-part series on the global climate. Last time, we introduced climate and the characteristics of different climate zones. This time, we're taking a look at the factors that affect and control the global climate. First, we'll have a look at the sun as the main energy source driving climate factors, and then we'll tackle the factors themselves. Atmospheric circulation, ocean currents, and topography. So let's start by considering the driving force behind all of these climate processes, the sun. Solar energy that reaches the Earth is called insulation. Once solar radiation reaches the Earth, it can either be reflected back into space by clouds or dust, or it can be absorbed by the atmosphere or the surface of the Earth. Insulation can also be reflected by the surface of the Earth, which is called the albedo effect. The balance between absorption and reflection of solar energy is called the heat budget of the Earth. So the temperature difference between the equatorial and polar regions can be attributed to the difference in insulation at these regions. As you can see in this diagram, the equatorial area of the Earth faces the Sun directly, meaning insulation is much more concentrated over a small area, leading to more energy at the surface. It also doesn't have to travel through as much atmosphere to reach the surface, so little insulation is reflected or absorbed by the atmosphere. This means that the surface temperatures at the equator are high. In contrast, the poles never face the Sun directly, meaning insulation can only reach the surface near the poles at an angle. So the same amount of insulation is spread over a larger portion of the polar surface when compared to the equator, leading to less energy at the surface. It also has to travel through more atmosphere, so it's more likely to be absorbed or reflected. Finally, ice reflects more sunlight than water or Earth, causing stronger albedo effects at the poles. A combination of all of this means that insulation and therefore surface temperatures become lower at higher latitudes closer to the poles. So now we understand how insulation creates different temperature zones on Earth, but how does it drive other weather patterns like rainfall? Well, let's start with atmospheric circulation, which occurs in a specific pattern. As you can see in this diagram, there are three cells of air circulation in each hemisphere. The key to these cells is air density. Essentially, hot air is less dense than cold air, so hot air rises and cold air sinks. As hot air rises, it creates low pressure zone. It also carries water vapour up with it, which then condenses in the upper atmosphere to form clouds and rain. In contrast, as cold air sinks, it creates a high pressure zone, characterised by dry conditions. As we can see, insulation heats up the air at the equator and creates low pressure zones as the hot air rises. As this air rises, it splits and travels north and south, eventually cooling and sinking again to create a high pressure zone. This cycle repeats, creating three bands of rotating air, called the Hadley, Ferrell and Polar cells. The circulation of these three cells creates alternating high and low pressure bands, which in turn create bands of climate conditions. Rainy conditions dominate where air rises at low pressure areas around the equator and 60 degrees latitude, while dry conditions dominate where the air sinks at the high pressure areas at the poles and at 30 degrees latitude. Furthermore, atmospheric circulation creates a system of surface winds that blow in a constant direction. These prevailing winds will form as air is sucked from high pressure areas to low pressure areas. Prevailing winds often play a role in determining regional climate. For example, if the prevailing wind blows inland from the ocean, the climate will be more rainy. Prevailing winds play another role in driving climate, ocean currents. Winds blow warm equatorial waters away from the equator to the poles, creating warmer climates in higher latitudes. This effect becomes weaker further away from the ocean, so that climates in the regions far from the oceans are often cooler and drier than coastal areas. An example of how ocean currents can influence climate is the Gulf Stream. This is a current that runs across the Atlantic from the Caribbean to Western Europe, carrying warm water. Although Western Europe is on a similar latitude to Canada, it has a far warmer climate due to heating from the Gulf Stream. Another controlling factor for the climate of a region is topography. Altitude has an effect on the temperature and precipitation of a region. Generally, the higher the altitude of a region, the colder it will be. Mountain ranges and elevated areas can also block the movement of prevailing winds. This leads to a rain shadow effect, where areas directly behind large mountain ranges have an arid climate because clouds and rain can't move across the mountains. So that was a lot of information we've just covered. Let's recap that for your notes. 
The energy which drives climate controls comes from solar radiation or insulation. Insulation is weaker at the poles and stronger at the equator, creating cooler temperatures at higher latitudes. This temperature difference drives atmospheric circulation, creating air cells that form in high and low pressure zones at certain latitudes. Low pressure bands create rainy climates, while high pressure bands create dry climates. And atmospheric circulation also creates prevailing surface winds, which can determine regional climate. These prevailing winds in turn create ocean currents. These currents move hot equatorial waters to higher latitudes, creating warmer climates in higher latitudes. And topography can also be a determining factor. Higher altitudes will have lower temperatures, while elevated areas such as mountain ranges can block wind and precipitation, creating a rain shadow. Alright, that should cover it. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you again soon.